That's May. Tonight, we are very happy to have back with us Greg Aftandillian, who has spoken for us before. Greg has been a member of the NASA Board of Directors since 2004. He has worked at the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and the U.S. Department of State. He is a recognized expert on Middle Eastern affairs and the author of two books, Egypt's Bid for Arab Leadership and the very useful and indispensable, really, Armenia Vision of a Republic, the Independence Lobby in America, 1918 to 1927. He holds degrees from Dartmouth College, the University of Chicago, and the London School of Economics. This summer, he will be the co-leader of a five-week program called Armenia History, Politics, Culture, and Public Health Issues, which will be held in Armenia through Northeastern University's International Study Program. Before we uh, have Greg speak, I want to ask Nancy Collegian, our chairman, to come up to say a few words. Excuse me. Um, good evening. Um, I have to apologize. I have laryngitis. So I hope that you can hear me. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see all of you here this evening. And in particular, uh, I'm thrilled to see Stella Aptandillian, who is Greg's mother, uh, Betty Baronian, who is his aunt, and Dr. Ina Bagdianitz McCabe of Tufts University. She's a professor there. Um, we're thrilled to have Greg here this evening, uh, but we'd like to uh, take a moment of your time for a special presentation, and I'm going to say a few words, and then I'm going to ask Anna Royan to please come up. Actually, Van, why don't you come up now? It might be easier if you step up. Um, tonight, uh, we would like to recognize um, a giant of an Armenian, uh, an Armenian in our community, um, who we lost uh, in April uh, of uh, 08. And, um, and I know all of you know him, John Baronian. And I'm sorry, John Aftandillian, Greg's brother, is also here. Um, John Baronian is someone I think most of you knew. Uh, he was a man for all seasons, and I don't say that lightly, and he was a true Armenian. He supported all Armenians and all Armenian organizations, including Nasser. He was a longtime member here, and he supported our organization. Uh, on a personal basis, uh, Johnny, we used to call him Uncle Johnny, uh, was a dear family friend. Um, my parents were close with the Baronians, and we in turn, of course, were very close with them. Uh, I miss him, as most of you do that knew him. Uh, he was a sweetheart. He was a, a, true, um, a true friend to so many people, and he did so much to help Armenians, and in particular to make sure that qualified Armenian students uh, matriculated into his alma mater and his love, Tufts University. Now, I do have to tell you, I used to get phone calls from John, and uh, He'd get on the phone, and he'd have my cell, cell phone, and I'd be driving to work. He'd say, Nancy, this is Johnny. And those of you who knew him just knew he had a way, and you knew it was Johnny talking. And he just was a, a wonderful human being. Now, one other thing that you must know about Johnny is that he, uh, besides loving his school, loved to collect elephants. And his collection, which uh, took over their home in Medford, uh, was lovingly transferred to Tufts University several years ago. And uh, we went to a reception there and saw all of, all of his elephants. So uh, a couple of years ago, a little over three, uh, well, about three years ago, uh, Van Arroyan, who was on the executive committee of Nasser, came up with a very interesting idea. And he said, I think we need to do something for John Baronian. And I have an idea. And uh, that idea followed us to Armenia on our trip to Armenia three years ago when we went to Yerevan and Historic Armenia, and I emphasize Historic Armenia. We went to Harpet, uh, Hisenik, Van, Kars, and of course, Uncle Johnny and his family are Harpetsis, so that was very special. So I'm going to ask Van to just say a few words, and then we'll make the presentation, and then turn the program over to Greg. We'll make it as quickly as we can, but I, I think uh, what we can say is I can understand John having an affinity to elephants, 
I know nothing about elephants, but I thought I'd better find out a little bit. You know, elephant has the biggest brain of any land animal, right? Elephant is capable of compassion, tremendous familial strength. That bond is extraordinary. If one dies or one gets lost, they all go looking. If that one dies, they all go into mourning. In fact, elephants are known as one of the three animals on earth that have funereal ritual. And beyond that, elephants are capable of art. And with that tusk, they're capable of adding something which none of us, which some of us have, but John had a, an extra a talent. You know, an elf can take that tusk and rub its eye, give itself a shower, pick up a toothpick and clean its teeth. Well, John's talent was an extraordinary sense of humor. Um, can we say what we're going to do? Sure. We uh, thought, and the joke really is on us in the end, we thought since he had a collection of elephants, that he ought to have one that came from Armenia. And we, being absolutely sure of what we knew, didn't know that John already had one from Armenia. So this is the second one. So the only thing I can think about in John, if he were here, that, you know how long the line was at St. Stephen's at his wake? His grin would be just as long knowing that he already had one he went up to us. So uh, that's what we brought, an elephant. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Nancy's reminding me that we had intended to give it to John in person, which is always the lesson when you postpone things, but in this point, he had gotten sick. But, you know, the flowers are for the living, and so we all should remember that. Now, oh, by the way, elephants are strong. We know that. For their, for their weight and height, they're very fast, and they think. And I understand that John was a linebacker. And a linebacker has got to be fast, got to preconceive what the heck that the offense is going to do. It's got to be strong. So John shared with the animal that he loved so much, wisdom, strength, compassion, <laughs> the love of art, and the love of people. You know, Nancy spoke how he uh, bridge different aspects of our community. I would always, when I meet John, he always wanted to know how his relatives were in Worcester. And always asked about people I couldn't even remember, but he remembered. <laughs> and he'd ask me who they were, and then he'd have to tell me who they were, and then I'd tell him what I knew about them. So he had this feeling, and his talent was something that this community needed so badly and so desperately in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. People who could bridge that terrible, fierce gap that separated the community. And John did that magnificently. And I believe that's a tribute to him. Thank you, Dan. Mark, Mark. I just wanted you to know that the sculptor, I met with the sculptor through some friends of ours in Armenian, and I actually have a book of his um, sculptures, he's quite acclaimed, um, and his name is Khachador Mirajanyan, and, um, and he actually made an elephant um, for Johnny, but it was so big and so heavy that we couldn't get it on the plane, <laughs> so we had to uh, ask him to make another one that was smaller and more manageable. So uh, Reverend Joanne Hartunian, who could not be here with us this evening, was kind enough to bring it back with her. And, uh, and we, we, we were so grateful to her. But as Van said, John got sick, and, and it was just not an opportune time to have a reception here for him. So uh, we would like to present um, the elephant to uh, his family, um, Stella Aftendelian, Betty Baronian. Helen could not be here this evening. John, we'd like to ask you to come up to, and Gregory, and also uh, to Dr. McCabe of Tufts University, because uh, I don't think Helen will allow the elephant back in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I, I'm sure that you will be happy to uh, gift it to Johnny's collection at Tufts University. So please come up and we'll unveil the elephant. that the elephants were leaving, Aunt Helen said, we're going, so we're so happy. Oh, wow. Wow, that's beautiful. It's manageable. Oh, sorry. The sculptor is a world-renowned sculptor, by the way, by the name of, if you're not Armenian, you're one of the of Mira Janya. Oh, Careful the wire, please. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Mark, talk tonight is um, on a topic that actually touches the lives of many, many of you in the audience. I've actually had the honor of interviewing some of them, some of you who are here tonight, and I'm very touched that you've come out on a very rainy night uh, to hear me. Um, but uh, it's a very important aspect, I think, of Armenian-American history that uh, has not uh, given, been given sort of adequate attention. So, as I said, I'm very touched and honored uh, to, be, to be part of this. Um, also, I see uh, Mano Young, our former chairman of the board. I remember him telling me when he was uh, a veteran uh, at the end of World War II, he actually went to London School of Economics, took some classes there in London. Uh, it was kind of typified, um, I think, uh, the Armenian-American experience to advance people's education. So. Uh, I always remember that story that uh, Manu Young uh, told me many years ago. Okay, uh, the title of my talk is uh, World War II um, as an Enhancer of Armenian American Second Generation Identity. I presented this paper at UCLA at the end of March at the Society for Armenian Studies Conference. Um, so let me, let me begin. Uh, sociologists and historians have long considered World War II a watershed period for millions of ethnic Americans. In a 1970s study of the World War II generation of Slavic Americans that was applicable to nearly all ethnic Americans who lived through the war period, the sociologist Stein and Hill wrote, quote, the war afforded a way of openly affirming, um, eagerly, excuse me, the war afforded a way of openly affirming and asserting through proof that one was American. The Slavic Americans sought eagerly to remove from the wider community's eyes and from their own the belief that they were foreigners and not American. Slavic Americans as well as other immigrant groups and descendants of the new immigration, meaning those who came in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, outdid themselves and sought to do, outdo everyone else. They were, in a way, more American than the American. In the words of one ethnic American World War II veteran whom Stein and Hill interviewed in the 1970s, the war, quote, brought people together who had never been together before. Before everyone was in their own little group, during the war everyone got to know everyone else and old barriers fell apart. They saw that everyone was human like them, that blood was all red. 
And from my research interviewing Armenian American World War II veterans, studying the letters they wrote uh, to their families and to the Armenian American newspapers, as well as the anthologies of these veterans, uh, these analyses that I just read were quite relevant on one level to the Armenian American second generation experience. By and large, uh, these young people, the sons and daughters of immigrants, grew up in tight-knit eth ethnic enclaves in the cities of the East Coast or Midwest, or in Armenian town in Fresno, California, or also on farms in those areas. Their parents were mostly laborers, farmers, or small, shopke small shopkeepers, eking out a meager living to the best of their abilities, uh, given the language barriers and social discrimination they faced. The children of these immigrants spoke their ancestral language to their parents and the members of their parents' generation, but English amongst themselves. Outside of their neighborhoods, they encounter an often unfriendly world where teachers and other persons of authority would sometimes demean them as being quote-unquote foreigners. Um, I think uh, Mr. Henry Heroyan is here, and even in a place like Watertown where he grew up, uh, a teacher referred to the Armenian students in his class as quote-unquote the foreign element. Um, although they developed a taste of all things American, like baseball, football, and jazz music, the second generation before World War II was often stigmatized as not being quote-unquote fully American. Now these experiences were shared by nearly all ethnic groups at, at the time, so say a Polish-American teenager or an Italian-American teenager in the late 1930s in a place like Worcester would be no different than an Armenian-American teenager who lived only a few blocks away. Uh, William Saroyan captured the essence of these common ethnic experiences, many of his short stories, the most important being, in my opinion, was called The Foreigner, that was published in 1948, just a few years after the end of World War II. In this story, an Armenian-American pupil, the protagonist in Fresno, befriends a Syrian-American classmate called Hawk Harap, who warns him, quote, not to fool, quote, with the Americans, just laugh at them. When the protagonist insists that he is an American, Hawk chuckles and replies, quote, you'll find out who you are soon enough. Shortly thereafter, the Armenian-American protagonist encounters ethnic insults from his teacher. When he stands up to his teacher, he gets into trouble. The story then shifts to the immediate post-war period. As Hawk gets ready to host a poker game for his ethnic buddies who had just come back from the war, he comes across of comes across of some uh, Americans who are trying to steal his watermelons. He takes his rifle, acts deranged, and threatens to shoot the watermelon stealers, and then humiliates them by having them sing various songs. He finally lets them go after he forces them to sing God Bless America. The story then ends abruptly and sadly, uh, with one of the Italian-American buddies having tears in his eyes after he relates the story. When one of his other friends questions why he was crying, Hawk replies, uh, why he was crying, since Hawk was only having a little fun with the watermelon steal stealers, the Italian-American veteran said he was remembering the guys who didn't come back from the war. Uh, interestingly, Saroyan um, also initially titled the, his story The Veteran of Foreign Wars, but then decided to change the title to The Foreigner, though both titles and the story captures the essence of what Saroyan was trying to convey about the prejudice he and his ethnic friends encountered going to school in the pre-World War II period. While other Armenian Americans and ethnic Americans in general may have faced similar prejudice growing up, but we have to say that Fresno seems to have been the place where it was most severe, such experiences did not in any way affect their decision to go to war. When World War II came, a great patriotic wave swept through the entire country, and ethnic Americans signed up in droves. Some of them, to be sure, joined the services to escape the insularity of their ethnic neighborhoods. But uh, they were generally sincere about their American patriotism and their willingness to fight and, if need be, die for their country. A common refrain from these veterans that I've interviewed was that America was under attack after Pearl Harbor and they were eager to defend it. Several veterans have told me they were very gung-ho wanting to get into action to fight America's enemies. And writing about the Rhode Island Armenian community, Varujan Karens, who was a member of this generation, said, um, for a time, as the war escalated, more and more young people from the Armenian neighborhood on Douglas Avenue in Providence entered the armed, for entered the armed forces 
and there was an unbelievable period when they were joining up one after another, which was very typical. And also in Fresno, California, um, as farmers, um, um, a farmer could be exempt from the draft because the War Department wanted, you know, increased agriculture production for the war effort. But um, most Armenian American young men in, from the Fresno area did not exercise that option. They actually went into the service instead. Um, after the war, Armenian Americans, like millions of other American veterans, took advantage of the GI Bill for the most part that allowed veterans to attend colleges and universities virtually tuition free. Most of the veterans I interviewed praised this legislation as being the greatest thing to happen to them and to uh, their uh, community um, in their lifetime because most Armenian American families, like other ethnic families at that time, did not have the resources in the 1940s to pay the cost of a college education, even though when we compare the cost today to the cost then, it seems you know, way out of sync. But, but, what, but even then, for a few hundred dollars, that was a great expense for most Armenian American families. Um, the GI Bill, as is well known, um, enabled millions of working class Americans to move into the middle class, and, and uh, it led to a great post-war recovery. Um, so in exer exercising these generous veterans benefits, the Armenian American veteran acted no differently than other Americans who were trying to achieve the American dream. So that's kind of one part of the story, that the Armenian American veteran um, shared very similar ex experiences to other ethnic Americans um, in the years preceding the war and then going off to war. But of course there were some unique differences and characteristics that uh, impacted the Armenian American of this, that second generation. Of course, the most um, telling was, of course, uh, that most of them were children of genocide survivors. I'm not going to go into the history of the genocide because, of course, most of you in the audience know the history of that. But of, in the course of it, of course, um, over one million Armenians were killed. Um, they were driven out of their ancestral homeland. Um, many of the survivors uh, were actually women because the men were killed off first. And many of the marriages that actually took place in America were actually the Armenian American bachelors who came to the United States prior to World War I to work in the factories and the women survivors of the genocide. And in fact, many of the marriages were actually arranged so um, say a person from Malatya would marry a woman survivor from Malatya. And uh, I know some of you in the audience will have parents of, of that type of, uh, those type of arrangements. Um, but for, and uh, so these, are, these, of course, uh, parents uh, had tremendous trauma. Um, and uh, even for the families who actually arrived, both male and female, before the genocide, who came to the United States before 1915, there was also a great sense of loss. Uh, because uh, oftentimes, not, you know, only bits and parts of families would actually emigrate. And so even if a family had come here prior to 1915, they would have like grandparents or aunts and uncles who had been lost in the genocide. So the, the, the sense of loss was throughout, um, and, uh, and, this, and this took place, this immigration of these survivors took place until 1924 when uh, discriminatory U.S. immigration laws were enacted where uh, very few Armenians and other peoples from that region of the world, the Middle East and, and other parts of Asia, uh, were, were then not allowed to come to the United States. But for, that, but for the firstborn of these unions, uh, these children were born, say, in the 1920s, um, and of course, I mean, look at you know just the, the time span. Then 20 or 18 to 20 years later, they were then the first to go off to war. Say somebody who was born 1924, 1925, the, when the uh, United States entered the war in 19, at the end of 1941, they were draft age or they were eligible to go into the military service. So the first born of these genocide survivors. Uh, were the first really to go off to war within the Armenian American community. Um, now as children of genocide survivors, they carried special burdens. They were often named after murdered relatives and they understood that their parents had gone through a highly traumatic experience. Though many only discovered the true extent of this during the Second World War for reasons I'll explain later. In some instances, the survivor parents tried to shield their children from what they had gone through. In other instances, the children could not escape the trauma because the mothers or fathers would actually have nightmares about their experiences. 
Um, and some of them, some of the survivors even bore physical scars in addition to their emotional scars going through the genocide. Now there's been extensive literature on the children of Holocaust survivors, as many of you know, um, and what that tells us is that there was a sense of overprotectiveness over by such parents of children feeling that they had to be parents to their parents, of, of, of parents making sure that their children's bodily parts were whole, of children feeling cheated by not having grandparents. And many of the second generation Armenian Americans have told me in interviews that they experienced some of these feelings growing up as children of the survivors. Now the advent of World War II was a real jolt to these parents. Having finally found refuge in America in the 1920s and having weathered the Great Depression in the 1930s, they were now faced with the prospect of, of sending their first sons off to war. Peter Balakian, who uh, was mentioned earlier, an Armenian-American of the third generation, wrote in his famous book, Black Dog of Fate, which I'm sure many of you have read, that his grandmother, who was a genocide survivor, suffered actually a nervous breakdown when World War II began because the conflict conjured up all kinds of fears in her uh, from her experiences in the First World War. Uh, Balakian in the book quoted his aunt as saying, quote, the news of Pearl Harbor, the news of the war, set her off. She thought it was happening again. Her house burned down, her family killed, death marches into the desert. And uh, for a time she actually had to be institutionalized. Although uh, that was maybe an extreme case, uh, certainly these genocide survivors uh, experienced acute periods of stress and anxiety, which were often witnessed by their offspring. Now having lost so many family members in the genocide, Armenian parents were extremely upset when World War II came. Uh, Karens, um, Valjean Karens from Providence, who lived through this period, said, quote, it was traumatic for many of these parents to fathom this new crisis, having lived through their own war experiences, which had devastated their lives. And many Armenian American veterans related stories to me of highly emotional farewells uh, with their parents as they left home to go off to war, including my own Uncle John Baronia. Um, in two cases, such, such veterans described and became very emotional telling the story how their mothers actually chased, chased after troop trains or troop buses as, as it was leaving the station. Um, and uh, it's, it's, when, you, when you interview people, it's, it's always, um, I always feel bad sometimes when you bring somebody to the point of tears, but it's, it's historically significant that uh, these veterans sort of witnessed this and experienced this as they went off to war. Although it's not easy, of course, for any mother to send her son off to war, and there were undoubtedly tearful goodbyes in many non-Armenian homes, uh, the fact that these mothers and fathers had endured and witnessed so many losses undoubtedly had an impact on the psyche of the Armenian-American family. So my point here is that the genocide issue resurfaced as a family issue when World War II broke out. Uh, but it also affected the sisters of the, the male soldiers who were going off to war. Um, for these young women, um, they actually sort of witnessed the trauma of their parents as their brothers were going off overseas. Um, and uh, they also, the women actually played a very important role, I can get into this later, maybe in the Q&A, but actually, you know, in the Armenian American youth groups, Say the, during the, say the AYF or the Armenian Democratic Liberal Junior uh, groups, um, there will be, be whole chapters devoid of men uh, because when the war came, all the young men sort of joined the services. So the women actually, the young women, teenagers really, actually ran the youth chapters within the Armenian American community. Uh, but they also, as, as, as I said, witnessed uh, the, the, the trauma of uh, the, their parents. And, um, let me just read you uh, a letter, or actually it was an article that appeared in the Hyenic Weekly of March 29, 1944 by Suzanne Basmajan of Messina, New York. And she wrote a very moving story called, For These Are the Women, about her observations and interactions with Armenian mothers of the soldiers. Uh, she wrote in part, I smiled through my tears, small comfort for the heartaches and tears of these mothers. <coughs> Excuse me. I wonder at their spirit and courage, these women who have seen so much in their time, who have watched their homes burned and their mothers and fathers killed, <clears throat> excuse me, who have left villages and traveled along the road to an unknown place 
and yet today they are faced with a similar problem, and they smile and take heart and comfort through one another. Their courage and faith leaves me humble, and I wish I could live a thousand years so I could tell generations to come about the courage and the spark that never failed in a room full of women, women who gave their sons for the freedom and dignity of mankind. So that, that article during my research really sort of uh, got my attention. Um, now for Armenian American soldiers who were captured or wounded, uh, there was great anxiety about how the news affected their parents. If a soldier was captured, it actually literally took months for news to come back that the soldier was indeed a POW, a prisoner of war, and not killed in action. Parents would only receive a telegram from the War Department that the soldier was, quote, missing in action. Similarly, if a soldier was wounded, the parents would only receive a telegram to that effect with no details about the extent or seriousness of somebody's wounds. So um, while all parents of U.S. soldiers at the time lived in fear of the dreaded telegram, especially one saying that the son, of course, was killed in action, I think for Armenian-American parents, uh, given all that they had gone through, it was, it was an especially anxious period. Uh, this is very different from, like, the, the, we live in this age of CNN and instant communication, where if a soldier is captured, you know, we know instantly today. But back then in the 1940s, as I said, it would be literally months. Um, I'm very humbled that uh, Kenneth Xandrian is here, because I'm going to read a little bit part of his diary. Uh, he was a POW in uh, Germany during the war. Uh, and uh, he was, you know, his hometown was Wartown, Massachusetts, and he kept a diary while he was a POW. And let me just read a few excerpts from this. Quote, we wrote postcards home today. It'll probably take three months to reach my folks, but I'm sure they'll be glad to hear from me anyway. Gosh, I hope they know by now I'm a POW. I can just imagine how tough they must have taken that Missy in Action telegram. And I can also imagine how happy they'd be when they find out I'm all right. Um, and then in another diary entry, he wrote, quote, I wonder how, how all the other fellows, meaning his Armenian-American friends, are. I hope Ernie Nahigan turns up a prisoner of war. He's been missing for quite a while now, and it really looks bad. Unfortunately, Ernie Nahigan was later determined to, be killed in act, to have been killed in action. His, four, his poor folks must be going crazy now. And then his last entry of his diary, Kazanjian, who was back home in Wartown after the war, um, wrote that, quote, my family is in good health now, and God only knows how much I worried about that while I was a prisoner of war, unquote. So in my interview with him some 60 years after this diary entry, uh, Kenneth Kazanjian confirmed to me that he was indeed wor referring to his parents' sort of psychological and mental health while he was a prisoner of war, somebody who was actually losing, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 pounds. So... The genocide issue also came to the fore in a very graphic and personal way among those Armenian-American soldiers who liberated the concentration camps in Germany. Um, in fact, the Armenian-American newspapers have some very interesting letters from the 1940s about Armenian-American soldiers liberating these camps. <coughs> Excuse me, several of the letters, uh, s several of them wrote letters of what they witnessed and how it affected them. Uh, Walter Basmajan, in a letter to his parents dated April 19, 1945, wrote, quote, I, I wouldn't believe this, meaning the, the stories of utmost cruelty, had I not seen all this and more. I wouldn't believe that such people could live upon the earth if I hadn't seen the bodies along the roadside, <coughs> excuse me, and the ones found at the concentration camps. I couldn't tell you about this before, but now it will, it will be revealed to the world and it will shock everyone. These Nazi SS men aren't people. They are monsters. <coughs> Excuse me. And I guess I can't write about this and tell it decently, because it isn't a decent thing to tell. You have never seen such hell holes of torture, bodies tortured, destroyed be beyond recognition. I keep remembering that this was what the Turks did to the Armenians. Only the Armenians never had a chance to let the world know. Actually, nobody cared or probably wouldn't believe them, now I know because I have seen this. And uh, Ralph Talanian, who was a, a relative, uh, was with Patton's Third Army going through Germany and Austria, and he described similar scenes of uh, bodies of, 
of dead Jews all over fields and roads. He had a difficult assignment at one point of actually putting the corpses in body bags. And when he came across a captured Nazi officer, um, Tulane, who was just a you know, private, ordered the Nazi officer to, to do the same task. Uh, the Nazi officer uh, spoke fluent English, answered back that, quote, officers under the Geneva Convention are not required to do manual labor. Well, th this just set Tulanian off. <laughs> he pulls out his pistol, puts it to the guy's uh, basically throat, and said, listen, I'm Armenian. You understand that? I'm Armenian. You start working now. And the Nazi officer, understanding what that referenced uh, to Tulanian's ethnicity meant, uh, quickly complied. Um, and then, but when he got back from the war, Tulanian told his parents about the atrocities against the Jews and what he had personally witnessed. And his parents, who were both genocide survivors, became so visibly distraught that uh, from hearing these stories, uh, that really he had to stop talking about them. So although all American GIs were repelled and revolted by the discovery of Nazi death camps, in fact, I've been watching the History Channel, which had the last days of World War II, and you can see ordinary American GIs talking about this. Uh, they were just revolted. Um, such sites, I think, for the Armenian American GI were really put into personal and family terms. Um, so that's part of the story. It's, it's, a, it's a depressing part of the story. Um, there's other sort of good parts of the story, which I'll talk about now, um, that uh, part of the Armenian American experience during the war was that Armenians, of course, were part of a worldwide diaspora. They met Armenians from all over the world. Um, and uh, many of these uh, encounters were very, very, um, how should I say, uh, uh, fun. And um, they, they were very touching for these Armenian-American soldiers because um, they encountered Armenian hospitality all over the world. Um, some of them were very fortunate to be stationed in England. Um, and there was a, a wealthy Armenian lady from Istanbul who married a wealthy who actually married a wealthy Englishman. And when she heard there were Armenian and American soldiers um, in London, she would invite many of them home, for the, home uh, to uh, her place for dinner. Um, Mary Hartunian Ashjan from Worcester, Massachusetts, who was with the WACS, the Women's Army Corps, uh, with General Mark Bradley's intelligence section, described the Armenian church in London as follows. This small island of Armenians was a haven to all Armenian Americans as well as Armenian Canadians who happened to find the church, and they were made most welcome, not only by uh, Father Tiran Nersoyan, who was the, the priest at the church at the, at the time, but by parishioners who invite them to dinner. And um, they, it was, what's interesting, too, is that um, there were actually some class differences, because some of the wealthy, um, some of the Armenians in England were from wealthy merchant families, and a lot of these American Armenian GIs are, of course, from, you know, uh, very humble circumstances, working class circumstances in America. So they were also, there was also kind of amazement at, at the wealth of some of these merchant families. Uh, the luckiest ones were actually stationed in India, and I wrote a paper on that, where um, there are, of course, many, many wealthy Armenian merchant families in Calcutta and other parts of India. And uh, some Ar Armenian-American GIs were, were stationed in India during World War II with the US Army Air Corps for the most part. And uh, one guy described the scene for me where he was a private. He was picked up on Sunday mornings in a Rolls Royce <laughs> by an Armenian merchant, who would then take him to the Armenian church in Calcutta, and then take him to his home and wine and dine him. Um, and in fact, uh, this guy was, at, was then going to be shipped off to uh, China. And he told the Armenian merchant, well, I only have a few days left here in India. He goes, let me handle it. The guy was shocked. He goes, let me handle it. How are you going to handle it? Well, apparently, this merchant um, rented apartments to American officers stationed in India. So through his contacts, he got the guy to stay in India longer than he should have. Um, so he was very grateful for this uh, wealthy uh, merchant. Um, so uh, there are a sort of number of uh, cases like that. And I think, um, I think Kenneth Kazanja in the audience said uh, when he was in, um, I think it was Manchester, England, that uh, he encountered some Armenians invited, who invited him over for tea. <laughs> it's very, very different from what we would do normally in the United States. Um, on the other side of things, of course, um, that, you know, there were wealthy Armenians on the one hand, but then there were, of course, very destitute Armenians on the other hand, particularly there were a bunch of slave laborers 
who were from the Soviet Union, who the Nazis then brought to, to Germany to work in, the con work in the labor camps. They weren't exterminated, but they were forced to be slave laborers. And uh, the uh, Armenian-American GIs would encounter these uh, slave laborers as the armies would then liberate parts of Germany as the armies, uh, the U.S. and the British armies moved from west to east. And uh, one, one Armenian-American GI um, saw a, a camp of Russian laborers. So he would say, hi, Huska, are there Armenians here? <laughs> And then somebody would answer back in Armenian, and then there'd be sort of a joy joyful uh, sort of encounter. Um, the other thing is that, uh, of course, many Armenian American families had relatives in Marseille, France, uh, because of the dispersion of the Armenian people, especially after the genocide. So some um, Armenian American GIs actually, when the after the liberation of France or after the end of World War II in Europe, they actually met their relatives in Marseille, and they actually re-cemented family bonds that had actually been broken by the genocide. And there are other instances where the Armenians, um, after the liberation of Paris, say, uh, the whole bunch of Armenian American GIs who were in France at the time, who had furloughs and to be in Paris, which was, of course, a great time to be there, <laughs> because they all described how the French women would come up and kiss them and give them wine and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, they, uh, they actually met the Armenian community in France, but of course, many of the French Armenians at this point were utterly destitute as well. Um, uh, one one American Armenian American GI uh, told me that um, this was he he saw French citizens actually go through the GI's garbage uh, because you know there was hardly any food, especially during uh, the months uh, right after the invasion of Normandy by by the U.S. and Allied powers. So um, they would actually give their food rations to the French Armenians they would encounter um, and try to help them as much as they could. Um, there are also cases um, where they actually saved people, Armenian lives. Um, actually, um, Edward Herosian from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, originally, uh, was in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, during this battle, uh, the Nazis had actually executed a number of American POWs in Malmedy, um, in Belgium, and they slaughtered over a hundred of them. So it, it got to be very, very bad where um, a lot of um, American GIs we're just taking Germans, uh, POWs, and just you know, sort of executing them on site in retaliation. It was a very, very bad scene. So he's um, then, Edward Herosian is um, the sergeant, and he's near the Allied headquarters, um, not too far from Melmody. And um, he hears these two German, two supposedly German guys in uniform, yelling out, we're not, who are captured, we're not German, we're not German. So he comes up close to them and he realizes that they're speaking Armenian to each other. And what happened was, of course, they were in the Soviet army and the Soviets, when they captured, the, um, uh, when the Germans captured a Soviet prisoner, they basically left them to die of starvation. And the only way out was sometimes was to join the German army. So these guys were shipped off uh, to the west to the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, so they plead with Herosia to tell his fellow Americans they weren't German. So you know, the other GIs wouldn't you know, take retaliation against them. So Herosha then spoke to them in Armenian, calmed them down, and said to his fellow American GIs, you know, these guys aren't German, just you know, put them in the, you know, the, the regular POW camp and take care of them. So there, there are very, sort of, uh, very in interesting incidents like that. Some of my favorite stories, um, which were part of uh, two books, um, uh, one was the Jimmy Tashin book on the Armenian American of World War II, where about uh, American, Armenian American pilots who were flying over Romania, they would actually bomb the oil fields in Ploesti, and um, then they would return to Italy. They would fly from Italy, bomb the fields, and come back to Italy. Um, two of them were actually shot down over Romania. One of them was actually um, injured. Uh, actually, both of them were injured, but one of them was, was pretty badly injured. He parachutes down. He's in great pain. And these villagers uh, put him on a stretcher and take him away. And he's sort of semi-conscious, and all of a sudden he understands what they're talking about. These were Armenian villagers in Romania. And uh, so he started talking to them in Armenian, but he hadn't spoken Armenian for a couple of years, and his Armenian was kind of rusty. So uh, then out of desperation, he starts saying the high man, the Lord Prayer in Armenian. So then they were convinced that he was indeed an Armenian-American soldier. So for the rest of the war, they actually took him to a hospital 
that was that had a lot of Armenian doctors and Armenian nurses. They took care of him for the rest of the war. There was another guy, Michael Manassian from Detroit, Michigan, who initially wasn't so lucky. After he parachuted down to Romania, a group of angry villagers charged him with a pitchfork and calling him Ruski, Ruski. So fearing for his life, Manassian yelled out in English, I'm Armenian, I'm American. So in desperation, not knowing any Romanian, he then asked a woman in Turkish whether she spoke Turkish, to which she replied yes. And that was the only Turkish he knew. Um, but, his <laughs> but his desperate pleas worked because um, they took the villagers, instead of, sort of jabbing him with a pitchfork, took him to a hospital. And the next morning, an elderly Armenian woman appeared and spoke to him in Armenian and held his hand. And she carried a picture of a young soldier pointing to the sky, which Manassian believed was her way of telling him that her son was a Romanian Ar Armenian soldier who had died in the war. But then uh, Manassian was sent to a POW camp. Uh, interestingly enough, there were two Soviet Armenian uh, captured soldiers in this same POW camp. And uh, they really looked after him. They called him uh, Pokra Yekbay, you know, the little brother. And then after the war ended in Romania, uh, Manassian was freed and he went to the local Armenian church in Bucharest. Uh, where the Armenians sort of uh, really kind of took care of him for a while before he was shipped back to Italy. And interestingly enough, he met the priest at the time who was later, later became Katholikos Vaskin the first. And then, um, according to this book I read, um, Manassian actually met Vaskin the first in Detroit in 1987, and they sort of recounted the story together of how uh, they met in uh, 1947, 40 years before that. Um, so there, there were a number of, of these stories. Um, uh, one of the, um, the most interesting ones, which is I think is a little bit fanciful, but I'll relate it anyway, because um, I always got a kick out of this. Um, the Armenian former Armenian ambassador to India uh, told me the story um, after I gave my paper a couple of years ago at UCLA on the Armenians of India, because uh, apparently he said this story is definitely true. But uh, there was a famous meeting by the Soviet and American uh, forces at the Elbe River shortly before World War II ended. And this was a famous encounter that's written up in the history books uh, where the Soviet and American forces met and there was a great sort of jubilation because the war was coming to a rapid close at that point. Um, so apparently the, the Soviet general gathers his uh, young officers together, his junior officers, and says, okay, who amongst you speaks English because we need to speak to the Americans? And uh, so a Soviet Armenian lieutenant steps forward and goes, uh, Comrade General, I speak English. And the guy didn't speak a word of English though. <laughs> and so uh, instead he shouts across the Elbe River in Armenian and somebody at the other end of the river, opposite the end of the river, that yells back in Armenian. <laughs> so uh, apparently these two guys became the interpreters for their armies. And, uh, and the story goes that the Soviet general then told his other officers, uh, this young lieutenant should be promoted because, because he speaks such good English. <laughs> uh, now, th this story may not be true. Um, because, it, um, and this was a popular in Soviet Armenian times, because sometimes the Armenians liked to show that they were craftier than the Russians, or right. they could outsmart the Russians. Um, so I'm not sure if the story was true, but I was going through the AGBU book, Our Boys, about the World War II veterans, and there was indeed an Armenian American at the other side of the Elbe River, um, someone named Vahan Aznavourian from Worcester, so if anybody knows of him. <laughs> Um, so he, somebody, somebody was there in the American army of Armenian descent, uh, but uh, whether they were the two interpreters, uh, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, uh, I think it's, it's a great story. But it kind of reflects um, the sentiments at the time because uh, there was a great deal of sort of ethnic solidarity between uh, the Soviet and American, um, so, I mean the Soviet Armenian soldiers and, and Armenian American soldiers. Um, and then there were actually encounters within uh, the POW camps themselves, as I mentioned, um, be between, between the two sides. Now, uh, the other interesting thing is uh, there are great encounters among themselves in terms of Ar Armenian-American soldiers encountering other Armenian-American soldiers during the war. Many of the veterans here um, express a sentiment that they were always looking for Armenians while they were in the service. And uh, when you think about it, um, 
there were something like 16 million Americans in uniform during the course of World War II. Um, and the Armenian American community was very, very small. Um, but there were something like 18,000 Armenian American soldiers um, in the war. So statistically, finding another Armenian wasn't <laughs> was not that common, but it did occur. Um, and there was, it was a great sense of joy when they would meet each other. And uh, Mary um, Ashjan expressed a sentiment many years later um, in a book that, um, in an interview, she said, quote, no one can appreciate the closest kinship which any Armenian American GI felt when another Armenian American GI appeared. Among those Odars, non-Armenians, it was like being at home. Blood is certainly thicker than water. And then this bonding of ethnic, so, um, of, of um, sort of ethnic, excuse me, this, this ethnic bonding also uh, led people to circumvent the socialization rules. In other words, under the army sort of uh, code of conduct, officers weren't allowed to fraternize with enlisted personnel. But she said that, um, quote, um, that uh, when an Armenian American officer came to see her, quote, I was just a private first class and we weren't supposed to associate with officers but we became related. We became very close cousins, which allowed them to meet. In other words, you could meet a family member who was an officer, but you couldn't <laughs> meet somebody else. In fact, every Armenian I met afterwards were all of my relatives. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, it's interesting too, is that uh, the Armenian American newspapers at the time, which, which really helped sort of me as a researcher, encouraged the GIs to write letters to the newspapers, both the Hyannik Weekly and the Armenian Mirror, Mirror Spectator uh, did this. And they also tried to raise money in the community to send newspapers to the soldiers overseas. So this way they kept in touch with their community back home, but also with, uh, with their respective youth organizations. And sometimes that there'll be, uh, just by chance, the, the, there would be these gatherings of Armenian American GIs, uh, at one place in, excuse me, in an allied camp in Italy there were 10 Armenians at this one Allied camp. It must have been a big camp. They, in the letters, interestingly enough, they, they couldn't exactly specify where they were. So the letter would be someplace in Italy, someplace in France, because they couldn't sort of narrow down where they, could, where they were. And then this private Beerish Hulgasian wrote to the Hyannik Weekly that there were 10 Armenians, nine Americans and one Canadian, gathered at a makeshift party at an Allied camp in Italy. Um, he, he, then he, he wrote movingly, uh, they had a great time, and then he said, one by one, the boys were shipped out to new assignments. In fact, even before we had a chance to include them in the picture we had taken, we are resolved that although our numbers may be few, our patriotism and courage will be high, and that our families and our country will be proud of our achievements. And that also reflects the great sense of patriotism uh, among these GIs. And then um, in the Mirror Spectator of July 16, 1945, uh, in the Philippines, there were 10 Ar Armenian American soldiers gather gathered at one point in the Philippines. And they also got together. And then in the book Our Boys, um, the, uh, apparently there was on one island in the Pacific, um, some of these guys even attempted to try shish kebab cooking um, <laughs> with, with the makeshift uh, army rations that they had. And interestingly enough, um, you know, one of the things that comes out in these letters was how much the Armenian American soldier missed Armenian food. Uh, and one guy wrote that, um, you know, the, the um, famous restaurateur, um, George Mardikian in uh, San Francisco, uh, had, the, had the Omar Khayyam restaurant during the war. And he had a policy where he would give a free meal to any Armenian American GI or any wounded GI. And I was always wondering if you're wounded and Armenian American, what would you get? Uh, but uh, one guy wrote, um, it was in a state of bliss. He said, I went straight to the old Mark Hayam restaurant um, and I talked with Armenians there for some time. We discussed mutual friends, etc. And then I sat down to eat and boy, they fixed me a swell Armenian dinner of shish kebab, pilav, dolma, turshi, mazun, paklava. I don't have to tell you how good that stuff tasted, especially after the rotten chow here at camp. Um, and and that, that was a sentiment expressed. Um, there was one Armenian-American nurse who um, was in Germany toward the end of the war. And whenever she encountered a wounded Armenian-American soldier, the first thing she said was they would say, which when they saw her name, each best says, how are you? Second thing they would talk about was Armenian food, how much they missed it. Um, 
the Armenian Americans in the Pacific Theater um, also uh, did an encounter Armenian communities because they were basically island hopping all over the, the Pacific. But what they did was really kind of look after each other. Um, in one of the books on the veterans, um, uh, Richard Demergent interviewed a man from Fresno, California, Seto Balakian, who was a Marine uh, from the Central Valley of California. He was hit by shrapnel in the Battle of Tinian Island, which was a very bloody encounter. And then he was evacuated to an island, New Hebrides, where he met an Armenian-American naval doctor, S. Paul Barr, who told him that if he ever wanted anything, he would help him. And Balakian later stated, quote, during my stay at this field hospital, Dr. Paul introduced me to many Armenians in the military who were stationed at different camps nearby. Many came and visited me at the hospital. This was a morale boost. And all the time I was in this hospital, Dr. Paul always went out of his way to be nice to me. I was laid up at this hospital for about not four months before I was sent back to Maui for recuperation. And a short while afterwards, I was sent to Iwo Jima. Oh. So can you imagine this guy? I mean, today, if somebody's hit by shrapnel in the chest, I mean, they're, they're ship stateside, they're long, no longer in the service, but back then, can you imagine this guy's poor guy, you know, going from one bloody encounter and then gets patched up then sent over to Iwo Jima, um, which was probably one of the bloodiest, or if not the bloodiest battle of uh, World War II in the Pacific. Um, the, the last thing I'll talk about um, is actually the issue, of getting back to the original thing, of identity. Um, for the first time in the service, Armenian American veterans had to explain, or GIs had to explain who they were. In other words, if you grew up in Watertown or Worcester, and you're an Armenian American teenager, you don't have to explain who you were, or in Fresno, because everybody else knew who you were. That's who you, who you were. But it, all of a sudden, you're being shipped off to places like Kansas, uh, you know, Oklahoma, Mississippi. Uh, my Uncle John told me when he was shipped to train in Oklahoma, he said people never even heard of Armenians in Oklahoma. Um, so for the first time in their lives, they actually had to uh, explain what an Armenian was or is uh, in Armenian history. So uh, this also, I think, impacted the identity um, of them. And in fact, the newspapers of the time, the Heineck Weekly and the Mirror Spectator, actually played a very educational role in this process because the servicemen would, would actually thank the newspapers. They would actually write letters to the editors of the newspapers thanking them for sending them these newspapers because it actually helped them talk about Armenia and Armenian uh, people to their GIs who had no clue what an Armenian was. Um, and w w one guy said, um, said uh, uh, some, some of his fellow servicemen thought he was talking about Romanian, not Armenian. <laughs> so a lot of times things got confused, but let me just uh, read this one letter from Sergeant Hank Haig Zarifian, who was stationed in the Philippines. He writes a letter to the Mirror Spectator in 1945, quote, the newspaper has been invaluable to me while I have been in the service. As you know, the number of Armenians in the Army, Navy, and Marines is quite slim compared to other nationalities. On several instances, I've had, I've, I have been questioned as to my nationality, and without hesitating a second, I proudly and with a voice that can be heard for some distance respond, Armenian. What's that, they say? So much so much without taking time out for breathing, I reach into my kit and take out a map of Asia and point to the present day Armenia and what it really should be. I proceed to tell them all I have learned about my father's country. I have clippings of the Armenian people and the country and its persecutions. And so he goes on and on about that. And then um, Private Gazar uh, Mergian wrote to the uh, Hyenic Weekly in January of 45, Quote, most of my buddies don't seem to know about Armenians and the Armenian cause. Sometimes they read the weekly, which I give them. Most of the time I am telling them what the Armenians have done in this war and the past war. So uh, that's a very interesting aspect of our community that uh, even though um, it was a very partisan time, um, the newspapers played a very ed important educational role. And let me just say too, this was of course, the World War II came shortly only a few years after the deep splits in the community in 1933. But what I've encountered was that when an Armenian-American GI met another Armenian-American GI, Armenian politics were basically left outside the door. In other words, they were so thrilled to be another Armenian-American GI, they never really discussed um, the internal squabblings in the community. 
Um, of course, when they met somebody in their own youth groups, they had more in common to talk about. Um, say, like, uh, the a an AYF member would meet another AYF member in the service, they would talk about what's going on in their chapters and things like that. But um, the, the veterans themselves uh, really did not want to get into the internal, internal squabbles of the community. They really wanted to focus on their own ethnic solidarity with, with one another. And interestingly enough, as well, um, after the war, there was a great effort made to make the Armenian American veterans posts uh, non-political. Um, and that's really a kind of a tribute to the veterans um, uh, to, to do that. So finally, um, what, what does this all mean? Um, well, as, as I said, um, I think on the one hand, the Armenian American World War II experience um, was very similar to other ethnic uh, Americans at the time. I mean, I grew up with a lot of Italian Americans, and sort of their, their father's experiences in World War II were no different than, say, my uncle John's experience on the one level. But on the other level, if you sort of dig a little deep, you find that the wartime experience actually enhanced also their sense of Armenianness. So the war um, sort of enhanced American patriotism among Armenian Americans of that generation, but also their sense of Armenianness at the same time. And in fact, um, a Jewish scholar has done a study of Jewish American veterans, and she has come to the same conclusion that for, for Jews in World, American Jews in World War II, uh, the wartime experience enhanced their sense of Americanism and their Jewish identity at the same time. And so my research has actually found that this to be the case within the Armenian American second generation experience. And uh, even though I think some of the, the members of this generation, they were very eager to escape the insularity of their ethnic ghettos. Um, in, in some respects, they found it very suffocating. Um, some of them didn't want to go back to, to, to that type of existence. But nonetheless, after the war, you found uh, the Armenian American GI sort of gravitating back to the community. And, and if you look at the, sort of the progression of our community, it's really kind of those veterans, I mean, I said, many of whom are in the audience today, uh, who actually sort of built up the community after World War II. They took over the, um, the things like the, the church, church boards or the community organizations, and they really, really played an instrumental role in, uh, say, in forming Armenian sort of political lobbying mm -hmm. groups, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we, I think the Armenian American community owes a sort of debt of gratitude uh, to those people of that generation. Um, so I think I'll just stop there and, and would be very happy to answer questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't have the statistics on that. I know a number of them did, in fact, but uh, I, I just don't have the numbers on that. So. Yes? I can add a story you wouldn't know. In 1968, I married Takui and uh, took her to Armenia, and we stopped in Vienna. And you may or may not know, but Stalin tried to get rid of, we had a disproportion of losses in the war because Stalin put them on the front. In the case of Vienna, it benefited the Armenian community there. They had a beautiful church, also an apartment building which had rentals. And the Armenians were the first to enter the city. And the first thing they went to was this Mukhitari's church and, and uh, protected it against the Russians. Huh. In that case, it benefited. I have another story that I want to know. I had to adopt an Irish grandmother. I got very good at fighting counter. I lived in an Irish neighborhood. So I became a captain of football and it was all set. We had one experience. Thank you. But there were Russian Armenian who came in and apparently had known about where it was, and they stationed themselves around that church. Yeah. It's a beauty. Well, I, I forgot to mention also that um, uh, some, some of the veterans have told me that actually um, at the end of the war in Germany and Austria, there were you know, American patrols and Soviet patrols. You know, they'd only be a few feet from each other. And you know, they would, as I said, they would sometimes shout out, our, shout out Armenian words when the pat patrols would pass to find out who was an Armenian within the group, and they would then sort of break out of their ranks and sort of embrace and then go back into their ranks. Uh, but there were, a lot of, there were a lot of encounters like that. Thank you.
Yes. It talked about ethnic pride. My father came here about 98, 99 years ago. A few years later, joined the Navy in World War I. And his brother joined the Army. And he said when he was in France, uh, he went to La Havre and wanted to go to shore and eat something. And there was an Armenian that was running a uh, restaurant. And he had coffee without sugar. And uh, he said, you can't have coffee without sugar. Went back to his ship got a few pounds of sugar and they thought it was like getting a million dollars. Right. And he just kept supplying them with sugar <laughs> only because they were Armenian. Yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of stories like that of, of um, Armenian American soldiers just giving their rations out um, to the Armenians in need, particularly in France when, when they got there. Yes? Well, a story like that that isn't so happy, this uh, young Armenian was a mess sergeant, uh, came from the same town that I lived in, and he told me that this story after the war, that while he was in Paris, he was, he was stationed there, and he was a mess sergeant, and he fed uh, Armenian families by passing rice and other, anything that he could Yet, he would pass on to them. And when he was leaving, <coughs> they wanted to give him a present. So they said they would sell him a diamond for $1,000 that was worth a lot of money. So he gave them $1,000 and brought this diamond home. And when he got home, he found it was glass. <laughs> No, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd like to know, I'd like to hear from the veterans who are here tonight, uh, we have a few of them, about how they felt uh, your topic covered a little bit about the fact that um, they were validating their Americanness, even though they had been considered foreigners. And I'd like to know how they felt about their Armenianness and going to war and then coming back, did they really feel more American or were they just a bunch of young men doing their duties as Americans, period, as opposed to being Armenians trying to validate themselves as true American citizens? I mean, did you just feel like you were a bunch of guys that were just doing like any other ethnic group, like any other American would have done? You know, I don't know. Could you, could you sort of... Do you want to clarify what I said? That's okay. Well, I, I think um, you're trying to get at the fact that um, w when you were in the service or in the war, um, in terms of your own identity, did, do, did you feel that you were trying to validate something inside of you that you were, as I said when I read the first part of my paper, that um, you're trying to be so maybe more American than the Americans in a way, or, we, or did... Um, well, basically, how did you feel as, as a serviceman? In other words, did, did your own identity as an Armenian come out more? Both. Or both? Both. 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 Well, can, can I see a, a show of hands? I think there's a lot of veterans in the room. Can I see a show of hands? Wow, there's a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'd like to maybe get a picture with you afterwards. Um, yeah. But. Um, you know, one, one, of, one of the veterans I, I interviewed um, expressed sentiment this way. He goes, while we were fighting, of course, you know, our main concern was staying alive and doing our job. <laughs> and, and so that, that's kind of a gut reaction. You know, basically that's, you're, you're there, you're doing your job, and you're looking out for your buddies, and you're trying to do the best you can and not get yourself killed at the same time. Um, so that preoccupied themselves. But I think once they, they had a furlough or something, it was a different story, then... Um, so sometimes, um, at least it was expressed to me, that sentiments change depending on the circumstances. Um, but maybe going into the service, um, and some of you may correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe going into the service you felt that you were validating your Americanism. But once you were in the service, it just depended on the circumstances. I mean, if, if you were encountering Armenians, then you would feel Armenian. But if you're in a battlefield situation, it'll be a different story. Greg, I think I can talk about this 
from a non-Armenian point of view. When I was inducted, they asked you if you were a Protestant, Jewish, Catholic. But, so this guy in front of me says, Greek Orthodox. They didn't know what to do with Greek Orthodox, so they stamped it P. And he started hollering words that I can't use here. <laughs> so they finally put Orthodox. Oh, the guy gave in and only stamped OP. And he was still ran mad. He said, I told you I'm a Greek Orthodox. So finally, the guy snapped the machine down G. And I started laughing. He's a Republican, right? G-O-P. <laughs> but he, was, he saw himself as a Greek. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it, well, as I said, this is a difficult issue to come to grips with uh, because, as I said, um, there's a lot of motivations that go in sometimes. Yeah. But my, my sense was, you know, this great patriotic wave swept through America at the time. <clears throat> so everybody was joining up. So on the one hand, you wanted to be part of that movement. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I think... Um, you know, when uh, you encounter another Armenian-American serviceman or when you encountered Armenians in Europe, um, all of a sudden you can sort of switch roles a bit. Um, I mean, when, when I was um, doing a, this paper on Armenians in India, um, you know, the, uh, it's inter interesting enough, the assimilation process among Indian Armenians was similar to American Armenians, where at the, by the 1940s, the Indian Armenians, young people would speak English amongst themselves and Armenian to their parents. Similarly, as, as uh, the second generation did here in the United States. So um, one, one Armenian-American soldier actually fell in love with an Indian-Armenian girl. They actually got married in 46 in Watertown. He brought her back. Uh, but she said, well, he's, you know, I, I interviewed her. She's still alive, the, the widow. She said, uh, well, he spoke English to me, but when we went to my parents' house, he then would speak Armenian to my parents. You know, but it was just almost natural, because that's the way he grew up. So I, 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 so I think it's, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's, it just depends on the circumstance. But I remember something else. The bishop, I, we met with the bishop at the Vienna, and he had a book there with some beautiful pictures of Armenian churches. And uh, Takui selected, if you see the Armenian Museum of America first brochure, it has this bird with Armenian carvings. And uh, I found the museum, and she did all the artwork, and basically that was one of the places. Oh, one more story. I was married to an order on a sabbatical in England, and he says, you know, you can get divorces in Armenia. <laughs> the bishop in England tells me to get a divorce as soon as possible. <laughs> well, the, the Armenian church, I mean, um, as I said, it was also a gathering place. I mean, um, some of the, uh, the veterans were fortunate enough to be in London yeah. and to go to the church. Others were on airfields and they, yeah. they couldn't get away, so it really depended on where they were. Any other questions or comments? Yes? Uh, maybe this is not so hot in America, but uh, this happened in England. Now, this uh, 50 years ago, our teacher, Dr. Madhya, that an Armenian trying to show that he's British, and he went in front of the Englishman and says, ah, we British, and the guy is British. No, no, we British. No, you can't be British by, if you, you don't have the blood. So uh, in 50 years ago, this was very, very true in England, in France. And uh, this brings me a little episode. In France, uh, two cousins meet from, uh, from one from Germany. And this is recounted by this writer from Istanbul who became a French, French poet under the pen name of Armin Lubin. Two cousins, after they argue, the French boy tur turns around and says, Salbosch, but don't they, uh, you dirty German, go to your country. So after a while, this third generation Negro writer becomes more, uh, let's say, native. That's the idea of becoming native versus immigrant. Right. Well, I mean, in that respect, I mean, the American experience as a whole was different from the European experience. I mean, because, of course, um, I mean, many of the veterans here will know that, you know, you put into a training camp and you have Americans of all different ethnic groups and um, uh, different types, um, where, and you're all considered American fighting men overseas. But, like, in a place like France, you know, there was a famous case 
um, well, several years ago that was revealed that a, a French Armenian communist was very active in the underground, uh, Marusha, I think, mm -hmm. Marusha. Yeah. And uh, the French, the ethnic French communists actually betrayed him to the Nazis and, and his group of, of other uh, non-French um, underground fighters. So that became sort of a, a big deal in the French press and it got exposed and everything like that. But it showed the different levels of assimilation where, I mean, even today in Europe, you have a different uh, mentality about who is a Frenchman or who is a German or who is a, um, an Englishman. Yes. I just, uh, you have any idea how many Armenians served during the Second World War in this yeah, country? Yeah, the, the figure is about 18,000. 18,000. And that was a big chunk of the, it was probably about 180,000 altogether. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a big chunk of the community who were actually in uniform. Yes. In, in reference to what you said about um, whether or not these men felt American or Armenian, a um, few years ago, through an Armenian women's organization, we tried to set up programs for all these Armenian families that had been here all these years, and we just couldn't get these families to take advantage of what the American government had to offer in terms of programs and what. And I remember I asked my mother, I said, you know, why isn't anybody, you know, going along with some of these programs? And she said, you don't understand how we feel. She said, we came here, we were so indebted to the United States for letting us into this country and to provide us with a homeland that we were indebted to the United States. We were not going to make any waves. We were going to be good people, which I'm sure was one of the reasons why all these young men willingly went off to war. I mean, this was their homeland. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, well. Yeah, they were drafted. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well in, 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 in that respect, I mean, I've, I've, I actually, I mean, I've interviewed people who told me that, you know, I, sometimes I ask, would ask questions, what was life like in the 1930s for you uh, during the Great Depression? And some of the, of course, their fathers were factory workers, they were laid off. And, um, and then some people, you know, were then, of course, forced to take welfare, basically just to feed their families, because things were so bad uh, during the 30s in some parts of the United States. But I've also heard stories where then, if somebody took welfare, they would actually go back to the welfare office and pay them back, uh, because they felt so ashamed of taking money from the public dole. Uh, but uh, they were very proud uh, in that way. Yes. Uh, do you know how many Armenian girls signed up with the wax during World War II? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't have the exact statistics, uh, but you know, you, when you look over these um, books about the veterans, sometimes you'll see like whole families, yeah. like you know, like three brothers and two sisters in the service, or um, a, a number of the women did join, but I don't have the, the exact number. Um, some of them were actually in, in uh, very sensitive positions. Actually, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower, one of his personal secretaries, was Sue Serafian from Detroit, Michigan. And, you know, she was with him during the plane of the D-Day invasion. I mean, you can't get more sensitive than that. <laughs> and uh, so some of them actually played very uh, in instrumental roles. Yes? I ended up in New Guinea, New Guinea Bay. There were thousands of us there. It's like a replacement depot. If they needed 15 GIs, they'd pick, pick you up and ship you someplace. Every day, different people would go. And we wait for the mail call. It was everybody, mail call me, everybody, the thousands of them gather in front of this microphone. And I'm waiting, waiting. No mail for me. All of a sudden, I hear this name, Zakarian. I'm in you know. And I'm looking, I went, ran right up close to see who he was. And after he got his mail, he came back, and I tra trailed him. And I said, where are you from? He said, Worcester. What's your first name? Ozzy Zakaria. Ozzy. Oh, Ozzy. Oh, 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 guys passed on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I should, uh, yeah, please, go ahead. My, my, my brother's name was John Galizia, and he was on the USS Meredith D434, and he died in Guadalcanal. Now what had happened, Tom Spiller and uh, Roger had got together to find out any survivors on that ship. So sure enough, what happened, 
they found this man in Patterson, New Jersey. And what we did, we all drove out to Patterson, New Jersey to see this man. And there he was. He greeted us wonderfully. And then what had happened is he was an artist. And he had drawn four sketches of my brother. Wow. And then my brother had gone around and made one of him and put knows. the little white cap on. And what they used to say is, he said that what it is, they didn't know what an Armenian was. And what they did is they said they called him John the Greek. <laughs> now, what happened is, when my brother had drawn the sketch of him, of this John, he had written it, Hovanes John Galician. Huh. Then we knew that that was my, my brother. In other words, that, that was his message, right? Yeah. That, and yeah. Now, what had happened, he gave us the four sketches to bring home. This is 60 years later. We had not. And the reason why this man was alive and, a, and he was on the ship, but he had got pneumonia in Iceland. And what had happened is once he got pneumonia, they would not let him back on the ship. And that is the reason why he was still alive. Wow. Thank you for the story. And Kirk's brother went down with that ship. Wow. And, I had Kirk, a, and Kirk himself went through a lot of battles in Europe. He won't tell you that. I had a cousin, uh, Hachazuni Chikirian from Low Mass, who was only 16, 17 years old, and he wanted to go in the service, and his mother had to sign for him. So he signed up for the Navy and served on, I forget the name of the ship. And uh, the ship got, we read in the paper that the Japs hit that ship, and six, six Americans were killed on that ship, including him. But after the war, we found out it was through friendly fire that killed those six on yeah. the ship. Yeah. And my brother served in Japan, and uh, he uh, met a couple Armenian families over there. Yeah, there were two Armenian families. One was Sagoyan and one was Apka. I don't know, right. maybe, he took the, yeah. maybe he took the IAM off his name. Well, that was so the, fam the famous Armenian there. lady, Diana Apkar. That's, um, yeah, you know, Captain Berberian married Atka's daughter. Oh, really? And, yeah. and Sergoyan, he used to be the chief, chief baker at the Imperial Palace. And on Sundays, all the Armenian boys would go to the beach and he'd bring a big bag of cold hamburgers for dinner. <laughs> but I never found when I was in the service in World War II, whether you were Armenian or what, that, that, that didn't exist in the outfits I was in. And I was in the occupation troops uh, in Japan, and the people over there were good. I never had any problems with them. I was an S2 intelligence <laughs> NCO, and uh, I used to have to make out a guard strength report. We never had one incident in the full year that I was there after the war. Yeah. yeah everything worked out good. And also, if Truman hadn't dropped a bomb, I got those two bombs that might not be talking about today. Right. I was saving the 98th division to go in. That was the next division to go yeah. well, one, one, one thing um, I, I forgot to mention, too, was the letter writing. Um, and many of you will probably relate to this, but a lot of Armenian-American parents at the time did not read and write English very well. And you know, most of the, the GIs could speak Armenian, but very few of them could read and write Armenian. So that, could be, that was a problem sometimes in writing letters back and forth. So actually, the sisters of the soldiers would be the interpreters of the letters uh, between the parents. And um, though um, Henry Heroyan here told me that uh, story where he would write a letter to his mother in Armenian, but then um, at, at the air base, um, like his mil mil military intelligence, uh, there, was, uh, there was a security uh, uh, incident at, at the base or, or so somewhere. Where so they, so they questioned uh, him about uh, well, what did you write to your <laughs> to your mother? So he, he assured them it was only you know, innocuous things, but um, but that was the rare occasion. I mean, most of the American Armenian GIs um, wrote in English. Though I heard a story where when there was a few Armenian American GIs at a certain say camp, 
camp or an island in the Pacific, maybe one of them would know how to read and write Armenian and the others didn't. And he would teach the other guys how to write, read and write Armenian, like elementary stuff. So they would write a letter to Armenian to their parents to be, you know, as, as a sort of a nice gesture to their parents. So that was, that's a nice story. I wanted to follow up on. Thanks, Greg. Uh, just to mention, question for you, which is, what sparked your interest in this topic? Well, I, I was always a history buff as a kid growing up, but I was always interested in World War II. And then, um, you know, just also, I, I've studied, you know, the history of the Armenian genocide. Then I realized sort of nobody kind of put the two things together that um, really the, the firstborn of the, 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 the genocide survivors were going off to war. And what did that mean? Um, and as I said, um, Sometimes, you know, the war is a very emotional experience for, for many reasons, but I, I found that towards now, like some 60 years later, some of these veterans have really opened up to me about um, how emotional it was leaving home. And I just found that very interesting, because nobody's written about that. Because in the 1940s and 50s, the, the, the emphasis was on, you know, showing uh, the Armenian-American heroics, which was there were plenty. Uh, but I, I sort of wanted to dig a little deeper what was going on within the community itself at the time. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Just to say that there, there are refreshments, the bookstore is open, and if I could invite the uh, veterans who are here to come up, it would be great if we could get a, a picture with, with our speaker. Thank you all. See if I can film them. Take this right out of here. Yeah. Well, you want me to get the guys coming up? Uh, it's going to be too much. Huh? I just don't want anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Safety first.